Thank you. This is called Sheldon Town. It's Sheldon where we're heading. It's cold dust that we're shedding. We're off to somewhere new. We're down, we're leaving you. Behind us birds are flying. Our little train is climbing. To the heart of children we're coming. A laughing, climbing, meeting. Everybody's celebrating. All the sounds of life beginning. As our train comes rolling in. Come down, come down. Come down to the railway town. There's always a smile around you can rely on. Come down, come down, come down to Shilton Town. The gift to the world was found as we ride down the railway line. Now those pioneers from Darlow brought the wagons and the cargo, the flash of inspiration. Built a brand new steam creation Though the works are now gone Its legacy still lives on I'm bored now for our next ride Over the bridge on the riverside Filling its people with joy and with pride Down to the ocean that's opening wide As our train comes rolling in Come down, come down Come down to the railway town There's always a smile around That you can rely on Where the gifts of the world was found as we ride From the cold face to the teens Always oh, still dream of endless possibilities Though life moves on Not the spirit, nor the song For the railway carries on Come down, come down down to the railway town There's always a smile around You can rely on Come down, come down Come down to Shilton Town Where the gift of the world was found As we ride Come down, come down Come down to the railway town There's always a smile around You can rely on Come down, come down, come down to Shilton Town, where the gift of the world was found in the cradle of the railway line. Thank you, thank you very much for inviting me to be here. And uh, what a wonderful occasion. I'm really looking forward to the unveiling later on. Um, this next song tells a story of arriving into children in the year 18. Let me see if you can guess what year it might be. 1825, yes. So this is the, the year that Locomotion uh, set off its, uh, its very famous journey. Um, and this is five miles. In fact, it's taken from a book that um, is already written called... The, I think it's called The Last Five Miles, is that right? The first. The first, oh, the first, the last, sorry, the first, thank you, I'm glad someone's on the wall. The first five miles, and this, this phrase repeats the phrase, um, only five miles to go, and counts down. So if you, if you pay attention, you'll follow the, the, uh, the mileage and we'll get close to children. So uh, we're starting off in Whitton Park, it's called Wonderful Giants of Old. And I should say that this song has been written in one of those workshops, so some of your very lines appear in this song. And if you listen out, you'll, you'll know which ones they are. In Whitton Park they dug the coal to power the life of man Take them up by Phoenix Row by the ticket stand The wonderful giants of old with only five miles to go On the slopes of Ellaby they sang a song of victory There's a whole that's drum that brings them up and down by gravity The wonderful giants of old with only four miles to go Wonderful giants of old with only four miles to go
As the sun comes up on Greenfield Road, a thousand have gathered today. They loaded up the sacks of flour and soon were on their way. The wonderful giants of old with only three miles to go. Wonderful giants of old with only three miles to go. They headed out the corners, pigeon horse drawn on the flat. But up to Brussels, and they'll need something stronger than that. The wonderful giants of old with only two miles to go. Wonderful giants of old with only two miles to go. They were up the top by ten o'clock. Thirteen wagons proud, drop them down by ninety feet and head to Shilton Town. Wonderful giants of old, with only a mile to go. Wonderful giants of old, only a mile to go. Only a mile to go. Shilton Town there was a plan, they'd be making history. Locomotion on the tracks in a bellow of steam. The wonderful giants of old with only a mile to go. Wonderful giants of old and they're almost ready to go. And Stevenson the fireman and the guard is Timothy. Hackwood shouts already now. And they set off to the sea. One more time. There were wonderful giants of old. With her now they're ready to go. Wonderful giants of old. And now they're ready to go. There's a lot of counting in that song, counting down, counting up, and making sure the rhythm works. But anyway, there we are, five miles to go. Um, this next song, this last song I'm going to play for you today, um, is actually a song written by Dave himself. He's very, very modest at the front here when he's introducing the project. And this is a song that's never been performed before, so I'm going to give you that kind of um, that context. <laughs> but it is a fantastic song, I really hope I did it justice, because this, this song in many ways, I think, really speaks volumes of, of Shildon and the relationship to the past and the pride, the proud of, of this the pride of this town um, and, and what it all stands for. Um, and it's very wonderfully titled Light at the End of the Shildon Tunnel, um, which just let that sink in because there's a lot, lot in that title alone. And uh, I just hope I'll do, I'll do it justice, Dave. <laughs> you will. <laughs> do it better justice than I would, Sam. <laughs> there you go. And it's a lovely kind of Waltz as well, kind of very... George Allen, is that the inspiration? Yeah, George, George Allen and the kind of Waltz. Imagine this being set in the 1920s, I'm making that up. Let's go to the 1990, how about that? There's a less significant fan, that number, I think. Here we go. <laughs> Each day. 
Today that our eyes simply follow to last This challenge leads on to the next But we'll never be down to a life without hope For we'll always be equally blessed A wise man once said we all make our own luck The key that unlocks every curse Many all the result that runs through this town Surely never be worse For there is a light at the end of the Sheldon Tunnel I have heard it said So we'll walk towards it unafraid And by it be eagerly led For the times of our lives are still waiting ahead What's behind still remains And we'll always know who we are It begins on the very next page And the words we all read and remind you and me The good times are waiting ahead Oh, those good times are waiting ahead Yeah, those good times are waiting ahead Thank you very much. <laughs> right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Board of Management, I would like to welcome you to the world's first railway institute. Many of you made a huge effort to join us today. On behalf of us all, we're deeply appreciative and most grateful. I'm very pleased we are joined by our guest of honour, Mr Michael Lynch, who is the General Secretary of the RMT, and Mr Gerald St Stack, Slack, sorry, Gerald Slack of the Auckland Railway Group, who will be speaking after me. When we reported asked if we could facilitate the NUR banner, we agreed that despite the challenges, this building was the ideal place to display such an iconic artefact. There were a number of factors involved, such as where to place it, how to protect it, materials had to be sourced and funded, and a workable timescale established. These were all difficulties that we were sure we would overcome, and that has proved to be the case. That's taken a lot of hard work and effort, especially the efforts of a committee member, Mr Selwyn Jenkin, who is with us today. Those of you who know Selwyn need no introduction. Those of you who don't, he's the gentleman sat down at the back. Uh, he'll introduce, or you can introduce yourself. He's, he's gone through some uh, medical problems over the past couple of weeks or so, and he has made a special effort to get here. So thank you very much, Selwyn. Uh, Mr Jenkin, he, he actually made, he made the frame from scratch. When you see it, it's a piece of work. He made it from scratch. He installed it, assisted by another committee member, Mr Adam Thompson, who's also here today. Thanks for your efforts, Adam. That, that's great. <laughs> and also, the efforts of Mr Dave Reynolds, who you also know, Mr Anthony Knight, and the members of the SOS group, the Children's Heritage Alliance, who have been fantastic in the work they've done in this club. Honestly, unbelievable. Um, and I can honestly say when they joined us, if we, were, we were in dire straits. Let's make no bones about it. And if it hadn't been for their intervention, I don't think any of us, including myself, would have been here today. So thank you very much for all your efforts to you people. You know who you are. Um, all these people give their time voluntarily, and their hard work's very much appreciated. They work long hours. They don't ask for anything, not even a thank you. They just do it, because they care about the club, like we do, the management committee, and the people here today, I'm sure you are. Um, that's about all I've got to say, really. I'm going to leave it to um, Mr Slack and, and um, Michael to, to carry on after me. Uh, I don't know what they've got prepared, but I'll leave that to them. Just before I go, uh, if I could ask Mr Lynch to join me here just for two seconds, please. Uh, what, we have, what we have done... What we, what we have done for Mr Lynch, just to commemorate the day... Just give me a second, Michael. 
We had put together a little goodie bag, uh, and in here we have some. Uh, uh, there's a T-shirt and there's some, a glass for the railway institute. Some stuff for you to take with you. Uh, in there, there also is an honorary life membership Ooh, for the club. So if you find yourself in this neck of the woods again and you want to pop in, you don't have to. You are an honorary life member. Uh, there is a downside that all honorary life members have to buy the existing club secretary a pint. <laughs> I've actually just made that up, but uh, <laughs> feel free. <coughs> and that's about all I have to say, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for attending today. Listen to the rest of our speakers. I'm sure you'll be educated, and please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you, David, and good afternoon. Um, and thank you, Sean, for those kind words as well. My name is Gerald Slack. I'm a member of the Auckland Railways Group, a small local community group set up basically to publicise the, I think, probably unrivaled railway heritage of this part of the country. Those of us involved will know that. Based on the work we did in recovering the... Oh, sorry, guys. Based on the work we did recovering the National Union of Railwaymen Bishop Auckland Station banner back in 2015-2016, which is now on permanent display in our railway exhibition at the Four Clocks in Bishop Auckland, up in the rafters of the Methodist Church. And anybody who's not seen it, I would actually urge them to go and look at it. It's actually a true work of art. We were asked, contacted by the National Railway Museum in February 2016, which feels like quite a long time away now, as to whether we'd be willing to take custodianship of two banners without quite knowing what they were at the time which was stored in the Hackworth House, which was up for refurbishment. So with our fascination with banners, both Michael O'Neill and myself, our chairman, went along and took these two banners. The two banners themselves were very different animals, I'm afraid. The one on my left, which was the 1970s banner, was in fairly good condition, and many of you will be aware, was actually marched and campaigned pretty much against the closure of the works over a period of about three or four years. And really, we managed to sort of display ourselves before it's found its natural home here. The 1919 banner was a very different animal, I'm afraid. It wasn't in particularly good condition. The ravages of time and sort of poor storage hadn't helped it. But I think in, in taking it on board, Michael and Neil and myself both realised we took on board the responsibility of trying to restore it and display it in the town. Really, while we were sort of saddened by its condition, I think we were absolutely certain that it had to be recovered to some extent. A full restoration was always going to be a big challenge because of its condition, but we thought we'd get it back to the state in which we could display it. So we started on our campaign. Now, Michael's already been, uh, Sean's already mentioned Michael. The campaign itself actually started in 2019 with a thousand pound grant from the RMT. And thank you, Michael, we'll always be generous for that. Without that, we couldn't get the thing wrong. We, we had a, a launch event at Children's Football Club, which is now three years ago, which seems quite a long time. I'll not hide it from you. I found the funding quite difficult. Not only did we land up funding within the, the, the auspices of a, a COVID pandemic, it was not easy getting the money together as a small community group. I made a lot of phone calls, spoke to a lot of people, wrote a lot of letters, filled a lot of application forms. Some of them were 4,000 words long, actually and chased a lot of white, white rabbits down dark holes, and I'm afraid didn't catch the rabbit too often, but here we are. That's all that's history now, and we're here today. We managed to cobble together sufficient funds to have the thing professionally cleaned, repaired, and stabilised, and, and I think we'll always be grateful to the people who actually contributed to the GoFundMe scheme that we set up at the time. As somebody who's written books about, including the first five miles, which mentioned earlier, about children's railway history, and written many articles in the local press, I'm acutely aware of the importance of children, children works within the town, both as a pioneering locomotive works in the early days where 39 locomotives were actually built to children and engineering works, and in later days as the UK is one of the UK's premier, if not the premier, wagon builder in, in, the, in the area really, employing over 3,000 local people directly on a 55 acre site, it's a big old site, and probably many more in little businesses that were connected to it around here. So the challenge basically having got the thing restored was to find the right place to actually store it. And for us, the Institute, is absolutely the right place. Founded here in 1913, which seems a long time ago now, the same year as I believe the National Union Railway were formed in 19, Michael. 
on this, been standing on this site. The history of this building is sort of inextricably linked to the history of the works itself. So following some, I say some fruitful and some very friendly discussions with Sean and the team last October, we put out a joint statement that it was coming home to this, this thing, and I'm very brit. And uh, Sean's already mentioned Selwyn Jenkins, so I'd like to mention him again, and Adam Thompson, because there was always a challenge in terms of actually getting the banner within the building. People are quite surprised how big these railway banners are, and that one is a big, big old girl. She's nearly 10 foot by 10 foot, and there wasn't too many present buildings that could take that. And really, it had to go on the main entrance area. It had to go on the main entrance area. But Selwyn rose to the challenge, and that's where we are today. For us, there's something very special about railway banners. I've had this conversation with a few people before about and works banners in general. I think they are a symbol of the sort of collective pride that the workforce have in the work that they do, their skill, their hands, and they're produced. And they're also works of art. There's probably a number of people in this room who spent quite a bit of time at children's shops, or certainly their family spent time at children's shops as well. I know Dave and his team are working very hard to actually record that history and take it forward to the future. Anyway, enough of me. I'm going to hand over to Michael now, who's travelled a long way to be with us today. He was just telling me no trains today, wasn't it, Michael? Rather, I, rather ironically. He's going to say a few words, and I think then we'll move out into the hall and actually have the unveiling of the banner. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dave and Gerald and Sean. I'm absolutely delighted to be here on behalf uh, of my trade union, which is still the NUR, by the way. It's still called it's the RMT, but as you'll see on the modern banner, we're still the National Union of Rail, Maritime and Transport Workers, and that's very important to me, that we haven't given our heritage up. We've evolved to meet uh, modern challenges in the modern world. And it's absolutely vital for me as a trade union leader, if that's what I am, sometimes I wonder if I'm the leader or if I'm being led, that we do evolve and we meet the challenges of the, the modern world. And this town and this community has had to meet those challenges. I know uh, what Thatcherism did to us all. I come from an engineering background. I am from the what used to be called our old workshops conference. I'm an electrician by trade. And I used to work repairing trains uh, on Eurostar and come from that same heritage as as this town did, and I'm very aware, and the songs uh, that we heard from Sam, which I thought was absolutely fantastic, and I think Billy, Billy Bragg could be in trouble the way that you're, you're going there, made that connection between coal and steel and railways, that what was called the Triple Alliance going back in the day. Some of that has been broken, coal's gone, a lot of steel's gone, the railways are still with us despite the best efforts of various governments that we've had to decimate that system uh, uh, and that heritage that we have. So it's absolutely vital to our working class communities across the country that we maintain our heritage and we maintain the values that they gave us, our forebears, our forefathers and foremothers, that put institutions like this together, put the trade unions together, and then made our working class institutions, our welfare state, our education system, uh, our uh, learning, the ability to learn and send our children to university to look after our, our elders and the attacks that we face now from this Tory government I'm not going to go too political are attacks on our heritage and attacks on the nature of what working people are and working people at the moment in this part of the world are in a very peculiar state uh, some, I think some of our people have lost themselves We've seen this so-called red wall turn into a blue wall or whatever they call it. And that's because I think we've lost a sense of our community. We've lost a sense of our value. And the shield and branches that were here back in the day, going all the way back to 1833 when we were really struggling, and let's not get too romantic about what was going on in some of these workshops and on the railway, because I can tell you, if you'd read back about the history of the railways, the exploitation of workers, whether on the operational side or on the manufacturing side or whatever was absolutely profound and that was the reason that our union came into being uh, in 1871, 1872 and we're 150 years old this year, we're not quite as old as this institute so we're very glad to take part uh, in, in initiatives such as this and, and give not just financial support but any support we can give, physical support if that's what it needs to get down and keep our, our institutions going. So I'm very glad that I'm here and whatever support we can give as a national union or the regional council and you've got three officers of the union at the back of the room, you've got two uh, of the Newcastle branches represented here, we must keep these connections going 
even if we've lost all of the railway uh, institutions and the railway structures, we can still keep our solidarity together going forward. And I, you know, Sean, you've uh, made me that invite. I'm determined to come up here. I've got something out of you today. The last time I came up, I had to play against um, Shield and AFC, I think. We got thrashed about 9-1. So I've got nothing out of that day. So I'm glad I've got something, a T-shirt and some, some gifts. But I was gonna, what I was going to do is give you a little bit of history that I've dug out about our Shield and branches. And some of you will probably know this better than I do. But just to show you the change and the evolution that we all go through. And we've, you know, we've been through evolution uh, to get here. Our union was founded by in the best railway tradition, a brewer, uh, Michael Bass, who was a Liberal, liberal MP. Uh, and he was a bit of a reformer, but the main thing he was worried about was all his beer that was coming down from Burton uh, tended to get involved in accidents. So he had beer all over the, uh, the railway infrastructure and it wasn't getting into his pub so he could make money. So he actually sponsored uh, the Amalgamated Society of Railway Servants to come into place. And it's a remarkable thing that a trade union of workers should choose a title that called themselves servants. And that was the relationship back in those Victorian times. Uh, railway managers, I was, I was telling Dave and some others outside, called themselves officers. And it was a complete cleavage and divide between what working people were like, doff your cap, show a bit of deference, uh, to the way it is now. Um, people feel more assertive and more able and independent as agents in their own life if they're in a trade union. And the union itself evolved, and Children shows the good parts and the bad parts of that through our industrial and political heritage. So the records we've got back in uh, Unity House, our head office, go back to 1910. The rest of them back to 1871 are held at Warwick University uh, in a collection. So the Shildon ASRS uh, branch, there was only one branch back then, in 1910 had 415 members. I haven't been able to dig out um, you know, how, what, how, what the division was between them. But I'm glad to say I'm going to present you with something here, uh, which is the two sides of our unit. It's the a an ASRS sash, which used to go along with all the banners. So when you had a banner party going out, taking it to a demo or a gala, all the branch officers and the banner party would wear sashes like this. And I believe this is a George Tutil uh, sash, that was, probably would have been the same manufacturer as the banners, and all the banners that were made by George Tootle's company, most of them, um, in London, in, right in the centre. The ironic thing is that George Tootle's company made three quarters of the trade union banners that existed in that period, and it was a non-union firm for its entire existence right up to the 1960s. So we'll give that, hopefully you'll find a place for it in the institution, and there's another little certificate I'll give you, but we went through a thing called fusion. There was a massive strike in 1911, 1911 of all the railway unions. So there were three railway unions that fused. It wasn't called amalgamation. The General Railway Workers Union, which was a more militant organisation than the ASRS, but a bit smaller, they didn't want to be called servants. You see the difference? They wanted to be called workers. And there was a our signal has always been a problem. The signalers had their own union called the United Signalers and Pointsmen's uh, Society. We had a strike in 1911 about poverty. It was about money, but it was actually about poverty and people trying to find a way to make themselves a living. Uh, along with the other union, the, the, the junior union, which broke away from our union in 1880, uh, ASLEF, as they call themselves, the Train Drivers Union, but all four unions went into a massive national strike and it was actually virtually a general strike because it started on uh, the Liverpool dockside with all the dockers and the, uh, the maritime workers and the stevedores coming into one national strike. And Winston Churchill, that favourite of Boris Johnson, put the army uh, into every railway and transport town in their, in their busbies with their rifles loaded. And down in Clonethley, where we have another uh, connection, they shot two of the supporters they were actually weren't rail women. They were people who, who might, as you can imagine in children, if there was a dispute at the works, the rest of the town would come out and get involved and they shot them dead in the street. And they occupied all the important signal boxes in full uniform with rifles loaded and bayonets fixed. And that was a complete radicalisation. So by 1912, that little children branch had grown up to 526. Not a big uh, growth, but at least some growth. And then there was a phenomenon, this fusion. Three of the unions came together 
Azlef refused to, to join that uh, amalgamation. And the ASRS from 1872, by 1911, during that strike, had got up to 120,000 from only 20,000. The vast majority of railway workers were not in a trade union and didn't have that mindset about what it's like to organise for yourselves. But 1913, uh, which is when this site of the Institute was built, caused that fusion and the National Union of Railway Men, no women unfortunately, but it was another time, we have addressed that since, uh, came together and it, it changed that mindset. And then by 1919, those three unions had joined and they were ready after the, the Great War, of course, and there's a, a, a war memorial on the stairs outside. Things had changed. The whole working class was becoming more organised. There was a massive uprise in trade unionism. You had Red Clyde side uh, with all the stuff going on up there. But what the government did in 1919, they cut everyone's wages. In the, mine, uh, in the coal fields, in the steel works, all across uh, the industries, because they'd had to pay supplements during the war to keep the railways going, which was obviously vital to, the, to the, the war effort. And the reward for all of the working class across this country was massive pay cuts. Not pay freezes, but actually to uh, cut the hourly rate. And that caused another massive strike. And the NUR was at the, the forefront of that. Uh, and our membership uh, grew massively. Uh, and we became the union that went on to become a power in the, in the country uh, and across our society. So by that time, when the, the NUR was formed, uh, which is what the banner's all about, and then I, I think, I'm suspecting, that it was that upsurge in confidence uh, and membership in 1919 that probably provoked the creation of this banner, because these banners were not cheap. People really had to uh, put their money away, and we, we know from the price of that one, they're still not cheap. Uh, when you get them made uh, properly. And we'll get, uh, Carl Arlbranch was telling me this morning, Craig Johnson, that they're thinking of having one done along uh, similar lines. But they would have cost these, these people, probably collecting money in this building, uh, a lot of dough to put that together. Because it's an expression of who you are. It's not just we're in a union. It's an expression of your community and your society. So we had two branch secretaries. Shielden number one. I don't know if these streets are still here. It was Brother Wake of 39... Soho Street, I don't know if that's still here, yes. and um, Children Number no. 2, which was the new branch, which I believe was the works. I don't know if there was a union in the works before 1919, and I think Dave was, was of the opinion that Children Number no. 1 may have been the railway, uh, the operational side at the station, maybe at the sidings and, and, and so forth. But the works was Children Number no. 2, uh, as it was created as an NUR branch, and he, Brother Hewitson, lived at 21 Eldon Street. I don't know if that's still here. So by 1919, I was telling you there was, there was only 400 when the, the first branch was around. And this is the remarkable change. Shielden number one had 529, but Shielden number two, a new branch by 1919, had 1,304 members. So we'd gone from a tiny membership into a massive membership, which must have had a real effect on the town, I would have thought, having that amount of people organised. And I don't know what the other unions in the industry were, were doing, uh, you know, and how they were getting on, but it's a remarkable change. And, you know, this institute was probably given as a bit of benevolence by the, by the manufacturer or by the owners, but I'm sure that people were starting to change how they felt about themselves and all the rest of it. But there was problems. I mean, the miners in, in the early 20s had a strike that the NUR was supposed to join in with and... and to create this triple alliance between coal and steel. And one of our notorious, one of my notorious predecessors, a bloke called Jimmy Thomas, um, let people down quite a bit, uh, and especially during the general strike. I'll gloss over that a bit, because uh, it's not a proud, proud part of our history. So by 1927, I looked that up, just to see where we were after that general strike, which is obviously a massive defeat uh, for working people, not just in this part of the world, but uh, all over Britain. There were then three Shielden branches, um, uh, but there'd been a slight decline. And I'm not sure what the difference was. Obviously, the works were still here and whatever Shielden number one was doing. But Shielden number three came into existence. But the total membership in the town uh, was only 1,700, so it declined. And Shielden number two, which is the, the branch banner we've got to do uh, today, uh, was down to 1,200. And nationally, we'd grown up... Uh, 
by, before 1926 to 390,000 members and had declined after the general strike to 310 because the, com the confidence of the bosses was up then and they were starting to sack people, victimise activists all over, especially in the coal fields, but in all the other the areas of the country. So the 30s was obviously a struggle. Uh, if you've read any, any of the stuff or seen any of the films that were made about that period, from the crash, uh, the economic crash across the Great Depression, it was a struggle for all working class communities. But by 39, you'd come up again in the town to 1300, there was a bit more activity. And of course, the war itself stimulated uh, all sorts of economic, uh, economic activity, especially with coal and steel and all the rest of it. And by 46, after the war had uh, obviously concluded, uh, we were back to two, uh, to, uh, two branches. I, I haven't found a reason for that in the town. But we had had over 2,350 uh, 2, members uh, in the town between the two branches. So it's a real ebb and flow which reflects what's going on you know, outside this institute and outside our control. But our national membership, would you believe, and some of our members here may be shocked in 1946-47, was 450,000 members. An incredible amount of people. Uh, and if you think about our, what our union's like, it's one of the few unions, I suppose, with people like the postal workers, that were able to organise from the north of Scotland, down through this part of the country, but down into Cornwall and down into the southeast of England. Every community had railway branches. And by that stage, we had nearly 1,300 uh, NUR branches. And we were a real force, uh, not just industrially, and of course, running the railway, but in terms of what the Labour Party was like and the Labour movement, there were very few unions that could reach every town and even the smallest villages uh, in, in some cases. You know, despite the power of the, of the coal miners' uh, organisations, they were only in the areas where the coal was, of course. Obviously very powerful and off, obviously aligned, but it was only our union, really, that could dominate working-class debate or, or lead that working-class debate in many, many towns. So Shildon reflected that, and of course, uh, you know, from that big decline uh, in the 20s and 30s, we'd, we'd come back. And of course, working class people under the Attlee government, the reforming government, uh, that gave us some of those institutions, the Education Act, the Health Service Act, uh, the, obviously the nationalisation of the railways and the, and the coal industries, that was a, a massive boost to our confidence as workers. And of course, these branches reflected that. Again... Uh, we went forward, very little investment in the railway, very little investment in industry really, and UK industry, British industry was starting to get taken over uh, by the new economies, the revival of the German economy, the Japanese and so forth, and the complacency I suppose of, of the British governments allowed our manufacturing base to be denuded and diluted. So by the mid-60s, Shildon uh, Number two, funnily enough, was the only branch. Shield number one had gone. Uh, I don't know the reasons behind that at this stage, but we only had 650 members uh, at that stage in Shield and two. Uh, and that was leading then after uh, the railway closures um, and the, you know, the reforms of the railway, as they were called, uh, the beaching cuts uh, led by a, 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 a great thing. We think the Tories are dodgy now and corrupt. Uh, with Matt Hancock and all that PPE contracts, millions of pounds being given to your mate, or billions of pounds being given to your mate down the pub. The beaching cuts, which ultimately led to the closure of Shieldon Works and many other works in the long term, and the closure of a massive amount of our railway, which if you had that now, with a modern electric railway, we could have a, a real green economy and a green transport system integrated into all the smallest villages that was led by a, a Department of Transport minister called Ernest Sharples or Marples, what, Marples. He was the head of the Road Building Contractors Association. Right? And what did we get at that time? Motorways. We got motorways because he was the head of all of those construction companies that were going to build the motorways. So he commissioned a bloke from ICI, a chemical engineer, to analyse... Uh, the transport system. And what answer did he come up with? We must have a turn to road. We must have road haulage. And let's not forget, they privatised the British Transport Commission that ran road haulage in this country. 
What was the idea that the British Rail and British Transport Commission had? You should move everything on the railway to uh, railway hubs for freight, minerals, which is obviously important to shield and coal. You should use wagons and uh, containers and all the rest of it. Deliver it to the local town and then do uh, last five mile delivery door to door, which is exactly the system that we need now to get all these uh, gas guzzlers and carbon emitters off the road. We had that system. BR wanted that system in the 1950s and 60s. The other thing he did, he privatised all of the road haulage fleet that BR had bought. It was the biggest, heaviest fleet in the country. He sold it to the private uh, road haulage companies for one pound per lorry. Unbelievable. And we still get them in power now. And people worry why, why uh, you know, people wonder why the Tories get away with it. Well, they've been getting it away, away with it for hundreds of years. And the phenomenon of a working class Tory is something that I'll take to my grave as something I don't understand. Um, and the fact that it's come back now is something that scratches my head, and I, uh, makes me scratch my head. And I think the only thing we can do, and we were saying it in the Newcastle and uh, Gateshead branch last night, is that the trade unions have a responsibility to come back into these halls, to come back into these communities, not rely on social media, not rely on uh, fancy messaging and fancy slogans, but actually to come out and speak to working class people about our values, about what we believe in. Because I think many of our brothers and sisters have lost something to believe in. And this is all part of it. We've got to get back to a belief it doesn't matter what your version of socialism is, as long as you've got a version of progress, liberation, equality and distribution, I think we can make a revival. And I'm not going to campaign for one individual party, but if the trade union movement stands up and reconnects with our people, whether they're in the unions or not, we will be able to revive our values, the values that were put down uh, by our predecessors. So... That's where we are. We know about the decline, you know, from 84, uh, from the early 80s when the, the threats to the workshops happened all over Britain. Swindon uh, was one of the biggest railway towns in this country. Gone. There's not one piece of manufacturing. Doncaster decimated. Crew decimated. These famous railway towns, skilled manufacturing jobs, knowledge, technical expertise, all destroyed so that the jobs could be exported abroad and that we could get on then with buying our council houses, selling each other cups of coffee and painting each other's nails, which is what we seem to have as a, an idea of how we will run our society going forward. Well, I think that's the wrong message. We've got to start earning our own living, I think. That's a very working-class attitude. We need to make things, design things and produce things and reskill each other which is what a lot of our young people are missing. They haven't got the skills and the confidence to earn their way in the world. And the only way we can do that is bringing back manufacturing, making things and having pride in ourselves and in our community. So the sad part of the story is that by 84, you know, and Gerald's got his book about the history of, of the works, and you all know that by 84, it was virtually closed and we only had 144 members in the Shield and Two branch and then, obviously, the work's closed, despite the campaigns. And I've seen pictures of that banner uh, in some of our photographs. And these campaigns went all, all over Britain. Uh, and the last bits that we've got, Derby Works is still there. And we've had to bring back down the road at Newton Aycliffe Japanese kits, essentially. We say that they're British manufactured trains. They're not. They're kits manufactured in Japan and assembled in a, a plant at Newton Aycliffe down the road, where they would never dream, and they never dreamed of it, of having my union representing those people. They went for a, let's call it a softer deal with another organisation. But I'm glad to say we have won the recognition at uh, uh, the, sh the Hitachi plants around the country, and we're starting to win back that recognition uh, for the other manufacturers, because we've got Spanish manufacturers, uh, German manufacturers, Swiss manufacturers, French manufacturers and Japanese manufacturers sending their trains here to run on our railway 
and we do not make a single vehicle or locomotive or power car in this country anymore. That should be a national embarrassment, in my opinion. But what they come on and tell us is, oh, we've secured a deal so that the Japanese can come and give us a few train sets that we can put together and then run around our country. There's not one single vehicle being manufactured here, whether it's a wagon, uh, a, a freight, uh, loco, nothing made here whatsoever. That's got to change, and I think our people should start demanding that. So I hope that wasn't too much of a lecture. I'm delighted to be associated with the Institute. I'm now delighted to be a member, Sean, thanks for that. And I'll be extremely delighted to, to unveil the banner. I'm looking forward to seeing it, and I want to thank you very much for inviting me and the relationship we have together. Long live the Institute, and long live the NUR and the RSG. Thank you. Oh, I forgot to say, so this, I hope you can find a place for this. Sean, if you want to come up. Um, it's for the Institute. This is an NUR certificate. So your Shield and Branches, when they were instituted, when they were given their charter by head office, would have got a bigger one of these, a big poster-sized one that said Shield and Number 2 Branch initiated on whatever the date was in 1913. So I thought I'd bring this back. It's got Shield and Number 2 Branch on there, but it's also got the Institute and the Heritage Alliance, and it's signed by myself and the, the General Secretary to commemorate uh, the restoration and the unveiling today. What this tries to do is capture what our union's about. What we said in 1913, that we believe in industrial unionism, one industry, one union. We don't divide each other on craft or skilled, higher paid, lower paid, it's one. So this is my station. My hometown is Paddington in London. I'm an inner city urchin, so that's Paddington Station with all the activity. You've got an l and &ER loco on there. You've got freight. You've got a works up in the top corner uh, where a loco is being lifted up. You've got Metropolitan Railways and you've got goods and cartage down here. Uh, but the pride of place there is an l and &ER loco. So I hope you can find a place for that. We certainly will. To Thank commemorate you. the day. And thanks very much. That's excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. That's great. Lovely. We'll, uh, we'll give those pride a place somewhere. Thanks again. Well, just before we do it, uh, thanks very much for that warm reception. I don't think I've been called Michael so much since my poor old mother died and uh, passed away a few years ago. So I get called a lot of things in the union, but it's nice to be called Michael every now and again. So obviously I'm delighted to be doing this. We've got to synchronise it. Um, I'm dying to see it. And I'm sure it's going to live up to expectations and the and the, uh, the billion it's had, it's a whopper if you look at the size of the brain. Uh, but thanks very much for having us. I'm, I'm delighted to be doing this. I feel like the Queen Mother. I've not had to do this before, but I'll make the best job we can. So, are we ready? One, two, three. Yeah. Hey.